Hi everyone, Ryan Dobson here for the Dr. Jeff Show. Summit camps are in full swing and kids are having a blast. In fact, my own son Lincoln is attending right now. There are so many kids who want to go to camp at Summit, but they just need a little help. A generous donor has agreed to match every donation to the Summit Summer programs. Will you help a child learn the foundations of a Christian worldview at Summit? Donate online at summit.org slash match and every tax-free donation will be doubled. Again, you can find that at summit.org slash match. God bless and let's join the Dr. Jeff Show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. This show is available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Edify, Liftable, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please go review it wherever you do get those podcasts because your reviews help more people find out about the show. And this is the show where I interview major thought leaders to show how our worldview changes everything. Today, I interview a young author who has already contributed to significant publications, including the Gospel Coalition, Crosswalk, and Desiring God. She's written a new book called Stand Up, Stand Strong, A Call to Bold Faith in a Confused Culture. This is going to be an amazing conversation because Sarah understands what's going on with her generation. She knows what the challenges are, and she knows how to encourage people to embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ. So please welcome Sarah Barrett to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm just so excited and grateful to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, uh, especially because your your new book, Stand Up, Stand Strong, has, has had such an influence on some of the young adults that I work with. And I rem- and I had an opportunity to review it. And uh, Baker Books, we share that publisher in common. I've got a. I'm going to be a yes. Baker Books author coming out in October with a new book called Truth Changes Everything. So anyway, it's fun to connect with a fellow author, and I'm super excited about this book and just meeting you. So, gosh, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, well, I am so thrilled uh, to be on the show. I was so grateful for your really gracious endorsement of Stand Up, Stand Strong, and just your support. It's been, meant so much to me. So thank you so much. Well, you've had an exciting time in the last few weeks getting to talk about the book on uh, television and all, all different kinds of places. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about tell us a little bit about you. How did you decide to become an author? What's your core passion, your core life message, not just the message of this book, but what, mm-hmm. what do you what do you what do you sense that you exist to do? Yes. Well, actually, to be honest, being a writer was never my plan. It was never my childhood dream. (laughs) And that might sound strange because I wrote my first book when I was 18, so still very young. But it was really something that God led me to so clearly. When I was 16 was when I really began writing more seriously. Um, I'd always have a, had a heart for discipleship and youth ministry, but it wasn't until I was yeah 16 years old that I actually began thinking of it in terms of writing. So I had written an article and submitted it to therevolution.com, which I'm now privileged to be the editor-in-chief of, and I had no idea that they would accept it. I thought it was a crazy idea, but they did to my shock. And after that, I just could not get enough of writing, actually seeing my peers reading and responding to what I had shared, to the things that God was teaching me was so exciting. It was so encouraging to me. And after that, one thing led to another article after article after article just really helped to hone my writing skills. And Uh, From there, a book idea came, first book, and then my second book that was just released. But in everything that I write, and not just in my writing, but in my speaking and just in my daily life and interactions, um, that one core thing that drives me, and it might sound uh, just simple or cliche, but it's really just the glory of God. That Mm. is the goal for all of us as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And I just want to glorify God in all that I do. And I want to point people to his truth. Um, I feel like truth today has been so, it's been relegated to this realm of the subjective. And I see that happening so much in the church 
And so glorifying God and pointing people to his truth, pointing people to the word of God, to that absolute truth of scripture, that is my heart. That's the thing that I always go back to in everything that I write and do. Um, I just want to point people to truth because we need that truth in this day and age so desperately. Mm. I was visiting recently with the founder of Summit Ministries, David Noble, who's been retired for yeah. 11 years uh, because I've been president for 11 years, so I can count. I can count. <laughs> but I asked him, what message would you really want me to communicate to the young adults who are at Summit Ministry sessions this summer? And he said, the central question is whether you will stand for truth. And then he paused and he said, it's the most important thing to stand for. So mm, that was so beautiful. Absolutely. Mm, that is so, so true and so beautiful. And really, truth is one of the most important things that we need to understand. If we're going to stand for anything, we need to understand that it's true and we need to know what truth is. I love that so much. Yeah. You know, I wonder, Sarah, the, the one thing I loved about your book is that you know, there are a lot of people who speak down from another generation to the young generation. This is what you should do, or this is the direction you should go. And in a way, we, we need that counsel. There's wisdom in having many counselors. It's the passing of the baton from one generation yes. to the next. Mm -hmm. But you're writing to your generation, encouraging them to stand up and stand strong in a time where, frankly, a lot of people are terrified to say there is such a thing as truth. And if they do believe it, they don't want to stand for it. So as not to offend anyone or because they fear being ashamed, mm -hmm. you know, how do you even make that case to, to those who are in your audience? Mm. Well, really it's, it's a difficult case to make in this day and age where the idea of truth has really been pushed aside for personal preferences and opinions. Um, I feel like in times past, whenever we were discuss Christianity or making the claims for defending the faith, you had to just you be, you began with those things. You began with all right, these are the facts, and but it was assumed that the truth was already known, that truth existed. So really, now though, we have to take a step back and begin with truth does exist. There is a moral authority. Uh, we call that moral authority God, and he does exist, and he has the right to impose these moral absolutes, you know, because he is God, he is ruler, he is sovereign. And so taking that step back and just laying that groundwork, that truth actually does exist because God exists. But really our culture, since our culture has made even the existence of God, this subjective truth that, okay, believe in God if you want to, you don't have to believe in him if you don't want to, then it's made our case for truth even more difficult because everything else has been relegated to the realm of the subjective. So just laying that foundation that God exists, he is the moral ruler of the universe and that his ways, his truth it does exist. It is real. Um, that's where we have to start and communicating that by like showing that the word of God is absolute truth, that it is possible to know truth, not in its entirety. Like we will never know truth the way that God understands truth because right. we're, we don't have the mind of God, but he has made a way for us to know his truth through his word. We're continually learning. We're continually growing, but it is possible. Yeah. So it's not that you're trying to know truth exhaustively. You're just, tr but you can know it truly. Yes, I hear exactly. Something I've, I've observed with uh, the students that we work with at Summit Ministries is they're, they're very eager. They're wonderful and fun to be with. Yes. And they're super inquisitive. <laughs> uh, some of their questions, I was just at just coming back from lunch, just trying to scramble back here to do the podcast and thinking, I, I got to leave the conversation, but I don't want to, but I, I've got something else I promised to do. But they, they, I've noticed this rise of feelings of anxiety and depression, even as mm -hmm. the belief in truth plummets. And I wonder if there is a connection or if it's just sort of mm -hmm. coincidental. How, how do you look at that? Mm, no, I absolutely do believe that there is a connection there because when you pull truth out, you pull out your foundation, you pull out clarity. You don't have anything left to stand upon. 
And, you know, I always go back to when I talk about this, just the parable that Jesus told of the man that built his house on the sand, the winds came, the, you know, it, and it beat on that house and it fell because he wasn't built on a firm foundation. And so in many ways, we are doing the exact same thing when we don't have truth. We are building our houses, our lives on a very shaky and unstable foundation. And so when we don't have that clarity, when we don't have that foundation, it leaves us so susceptible to anxiety, to depression, to feeling like we're not secure or safe in this world because what foundation do we have? What assurance do we have of something bigger than ourselves? You know, it's kind of the whole principle that when you have boundaries, it's a little safer. Like, you know, children, when they have boundaries, they will reach the edge of the boundary. They'll play in the entire yard if there's a fence. But if there's not, then, you know, you stay in the middle, you stay where it's safe. So those boundaries, the boundaries of truth and moral absolutes, they provide more liberty and provide more freedom for us. But when we don't have that, it leaves us so susceptible to that skyrocketing anxiety and depression. And I've noticed the exact same thing, that it is rising in this generation of young people. It's rising so strongly, so prevalently. And there are so many other factors as well, but I would definitely say that there is a a, a correlation there with the fact that we don't have that foundation of truth anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it sounds comforting on the one hand to, for somebody to say, well, what, what feels true to you? You're the center of your reality. Mm -hmm. You get to be in charge of your life. But then you think on the other hand, but I don't know where I am. How, how exactly. am I supposed to, you know, wh wh what are, where am I going? Am I even going any place? How would I know if I'm going someplace, if I'm the measure? Yeah. Yes. It's a tough spot to be. Uh, well, it, it, in your book, you're really encouraging people to, to, uh, well, I love the title is straightforward and simple. I love it. Stand up, stand strong. And, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You one, I love the way in the book you tackle so many issues that young adults are asking about these days and you're pointing them back just as you said earlier to God's glory, to the truth of scripture and then letting that be the guide for yes. helping people think through all of these issues. I'd love for you to just take, just, you know, let's just talk through some of them. What, but let's start with the one you've gotten the, the most response to, and I don't know what it is. I'm just uh, throwing it out there, but I, I know that as you've written the book now, you do a lot, uh, you're involved in social media. You're very responsive to your book mm -hmm. fans and to the people who follow you. Mm -hmm. So what are some, what's the biggest thing that people are saying that one I got a question about? Yes. Well, I would say that there's two that are kind of tied. Okay. The Let's first talk about would both. Be, I, yeah. The first would be identity that who are we? Uh, it really comes all down to that foundation of identity. And then the second that I've heard so much, I've received so many messages about uh, Facebook, Instagram comments, and that sexual orientation um, and you could tie on gender. So I guess technically that would be three of the chapters of the book, uh, identity, sexual orientation, and gender. Um, they're all very, very closely connected though. And so I've especially heard from so many parents who have read the book or have heard an interview or something. And they're wondering, all right, my, my young teen is questioning her beliefs about sexuality, or she believes that she's a lesbian or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. And so she's there. The parents are really wondering and struggling with how do I approach this? How do I navigate this? How do I share what is true about gender and sexuality um, without like being judgmental or condemning? Uh, how do I approach that conversation? So those are the three that have really stood out the most as I've received early feedback. Uh, just in these last few few weeks after release. Yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised at all. I can completely see how that's the case. And I, I yeah. appreciate the way you said that they're actually interrelated. Because if you're struggling yes. with your identity overall, then you probably will struggle with your gender identity. Yeah. Because gender is, you know, your sexuality is part of who you were designed to be. Uh, but tell us, let's talk about identity first. When uh, young adults ask this identity question, are they, are they 
kind of compelled to root their identity in something that they see happening in the culture or they just feel lost or they feel that they don't have a sense of meaning? What, what what's mm-hmm. what's the real struggle there? Mm. Well, as a society and especially as a society of teenagers, uh, we're very rootless. We don't have like we were just talking about. We don't have a foundation because we've pulled, we've pulled out everything that's objective. Um, and so we are left really floundering with these questions of who am I? Do I matter? Am I loved? Am I purposeful? Um, does my existence count for anything? And so what the real struggle is, and you know, social media plays a part into this as well. You know, the comparison of everyone else online, of thinking everyone else has the perfect life or everyone else looks better or acts better than we do. Hmm. Um, and so we're just a very rootless a society, a really rootless generation of teens when we don't have a foundation of there is a God who created me perfectly in his image, who loves me absolutely, who died to save me. When we don't have that foundation, we are left really floundering with questions of who we are. If we don't know who God is, we will never know who we are. And so it really, it those are the biggest issues I would say. And there are, there are so many subsets of that, you know, subsets of body image, subsets of uh, just other, other facets of identity. Um, but it really comes down to not having that foundation of knowing who God is, which really informs everything about who we are. That's, that's amazing. Uh, I can, I can see where, where that leads somebody into, okay, if I, if, if I have a curated life online Mm -hmm. and people respond to that, then I guess I am who I present myself to be. But the truth is I know that I'm not who I present myself to be. Is that where the core struggle is? In a way, yes. Like we all, that would kind of be like a imposter syndrome or we mm-hmm. all feel like we're a fraud, uh, you know, because I we don't measure up to our perfectly curated lives. I mean, <laughs> who can? Who can? <laughs> but right. yes, yes. Uh, that that comparison, comparing between our real lives and our online lives and everyone else's online life and thinking that they have it together, we don't, or at least we look that look like we do. Um that that does create such a struggle for for us in our pursuit of a solid foundation of identity. You could also begin to feel that the 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 you that you present online and people respond to it that somehow affirms it. So yeah. let's say somebody's struggling with their gender identity and they present something online and say I'm struggling with this like the first few people who respond really shape that person's future yeah. actions. And they could be yes. completely random people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many voices like on social media, uh, whether or not we put it out there, we're still receiving input all the time on whether or not this is true or right or good. And especially like if you say, if you put something out there, if you put out a struggle or if you like come out on social media in the case of like gender or sexuality, um, that affirmation, yes, it will either tear it down or build it up. Um, so many voices, so many things coming at us from all angles that, uh, do affect that understanding of, of who we are. Talk a a little bit about, because you mentioned a lot of, it's a lot of parents who are reaching out saying, I'm really concerned. Mm -hmm. My daughter thinks that she's a lesbian or uh, my child is confused about gender identity. Uh, It's super hard to respond to that in social media format or even by email or anything else. But what kind of guidance do you give? Because I I can imagine somebody going on a walk right now or a hike and they're out with the dog and they're thinking, yep, uh, this I hope he asked yeah. that because that's a question that I have for my own family or for my friends. Yeah. Yes, it is so difficult to know how to respond because every situation is individual. It comes with its own context. It comes with its own uh, background. And it's really, it's just its own individual struggles. But a few 
uh, over all things that I always encourage parents that are, are dealing with this to one, to create a safe place that it's all right for your, your child, your teenager to come to you with these struggles. Uh, it's a good thing if they come to you with these struggles. Don't automatically freak out if they come to you saying, mom, I think I'm gay or transgender. Um, allow that safe place for them to be able to process that with you, to be able to talk about it with you. If they come to you and they don't receive that, that safety net of this is something I can talk about with my parents, then they will automatically retreat. They'll pull yeah. back. They'll go to someone else. So allow them to come to you. Allow them to talk about it. Ask them really good questions like, what has made you think this? How has, you know, what other things in your life is contributing to this? Do you think like, what are you listening to watching? Who else is, you know, who else have you told? Who else is affirming this in your life? Ask good questions. Try to get to the root of how it came about. The things that have led to this moment in time where your child thinks that, you know, they're a different gender or sexuality. Um, so create that safe place, that environment where you can just talk about it, discuss things with them, and continue to point them ultimately to Jesus, even more than you continue to point them to a biblical view of sexuality, because what your teen needs above anything else is Jesus Christ. They need the gospel. They need Jesus to change and work in their heart and for the Holy Spirit to do that work of transformation in them because Jesus and the Holy Spirit can convince your teen of the truth way better than you can. Yeah. So continue to point them to the truth of Jesus as well as the truth of what the Bible says about sexuality. Like, yes, do relate and do talk about what the word of God says and what is true as regards their gender and sexuality, but keep the gospel foremost and central. And then lastly, um, pray for them so much. Pray for them consistently. Pray that God would do that work in them. Um, pray that they would become uncomfortable in sin and would choose to live in holiness. Pray that they would just have a desire to know the truth, uh, to know Jesus Christ and that, um, that the work that all the other voices that they're hearing would be drowned out by the voice of truth, by, by the voice of, of God's word. So those are the top three things. There's so many other things that uh, parents could do, but those are the three ones that I always encourage and, and try to keep, keep center. Yeah. And, and I can remember those and I can, I can apply those that you want to keep the relationship going. You want to create a safe place, not safe like safe spaces on campus where you're safe from thinking, but safe to think and to talk exactly. about what's going cool. on. And then second, to continually point them toward Jesus, because that's at the core. I, I was really struck by what you said, that more than a biblical understanding of gender, they need Jesus. And that yes. th with that relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins to guide them into the truth. Yeah. And then third is just, uh, the, it's just constant prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, yes. do you, is it uh, similar when, when a young person reaches out to you, is it similar advice that you give? I do encourage, uh, ultimately, well, I kind of, I guess you could say, take on the role of parent in that where yeah. I want to point them to Jesus. I want to point them to the gospel. Uh, yes, I want to communicate the truth. I want to communicate a biblical view of gender and sexuality to them, um, but just point them to Christ and pray for them and uh, listen to them, hear their questions, hear their struggles, hear what's brought them to this point. Um, and then when it is someone that is actually struggling with that themselves, um, it's, it's a little bit harder because you are reaching into a very sensitive place in their hearts maybe something that they are just newly struggling with, or they're still trying to understand it themselves, or um, there's a lot more to consider there. But um, again, I'm just so encouraged that the Holy Spirit and the gospel is really what will do the work there. So just continually to point them to Christ and to share the truth and to really know that our job in communicating to them is not to 
convince them of a perspective. Our job is not to make them believe at the end of our conversation something, but really to to point them to what is true, to, uh, I've heard it said, just put a stone in their shoe, yes. something that they can think about, and then let God do the work through the Holy Spirit in letting that seed grow, the seeds that you planted, let those things grow. And so mm. just having compassion in those interactions, compassion and understanding, as well as a solid grounding on the word of God. That's the the perfect, not an easy balance, but the perfect balance for these conversations. Mm. I think this is so good. I, the it, Your book, again, is Stand Up, Stand Strong. And uh, Sarah Barrett, thank you. This has been a fun conversation. I, I'd, I'd love to continue more about the book, but I just got this curiosity about being a writer. And of course, I, I love to write. I think I, maybe I love to yeah. teach, and therefore I write as part of being a teacher. <laughs> But uh, I'm just really curious to meet other authors and find out what inspires them. And I, I have this sense, just as we were talking about just before the show, that there are a lot of people thinking, I might have a book in me. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you you approach that. One thing I've, I've actually found myself saying to someone, I don't know if this is good advice or not. It just was, came to my head. I said, do you feel strongly enough about this book that you would write it even if you knew that no one would ever read mm. it? In other yeah. words, this is something that you, not only that you can do, but that you cannot not do. Yeah. Uh, because in the process of writing a book, it, it you're going to feel some pain. <laughs> and you need to- <laughs> That you, is the truth. <laughs> you need to have a core motivation that gets you gets you through that. Anyway, so I just, it's fun to talk to a fellow author and I'm curious uh, what the writing process is like for you, uh, what it's what it's like to write a book. Uh, what you would say to somebody who thinks that might be something they would like to do as well. Well, the word that first comes to mind when you ask, what is it like to write a book is it's grueling. It is hard work. Yes. <laughs> it is yeah. very hard work. Um, but like I said at the beginning, writing was never my childhood dream. It was never something that I really planned on doing. So God surprised me with leading me to writing. Uh, my sister is actually a writer as well. So I was very familiar with the writing industry, with what it was like to write a book. I knew it was hard work. I knew it was uh, a big job. But as I was writing article after article and honing my writing skills, like I said, I had this book idea. Um, my first book idea was actually not my first book, uh, Love Riot. It was a different different idea, which I am so thankful now that did not happen because looking back, it was not a good idea. <laughs> but God was gracious that with that idea, it led me to my agent and started the whole process for me. But uh, as I began uh, writing Love Riot eventually, as that was contracted, um, I, again, I look back and I see my early attempts at writing a book and I am now thankful for editors because they helped strengthen that one so much because I, I was testing the waters. I was figuring it all out there with that first book, never having done it before. Um, but looking back from the lessons I learned from that and now having written a second book, um, you have to have, like you said, a passion for the topic first because that will spur you on on those days when I said I wanted to throw my computer out the window and never look at the book again. Uh, it it will help you in those hard in those hard um, writing days and writing seasons. So having a passion for it, doing your research ahead of time was critical for me, especially with the second book. Um, it just it's such a research heavy topic that you need to have. You need to know what you're writing about in order to write about it. And that might sound simplistic, but I think it's sometimes maybe a step that we forget about a little bit. We have a passion for it, but not necessarily the knowledge that we need to actually communicate it. So getting that down and then also just having a plan, like having it all like I have an I had a notebook when I would write each chapter. Uh, when I would just scribble every idea that I had for yeah. that chapter, I would write 
sections, you know, like, okay, I want to cover this, or here's my sources for this. Um, I would even write parts of it down by hand in this notebook. So I did the rough work in the notebook, and then I could transfer it onto the screen um, and type it all out in hopefully a somewhat finished product. <laughs> um, yeah. But that was sort of my process, and I've learned so much. I'm sure if I wrote another book, I would do some things differently. It's something that you learn and grow. You evolve as you do it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it is it is a grueling process yeah. for sure. And not to mention that when you get the book written the way you think it really comes together, an editor gets a hold of it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh yes. Oh, oh yes. The story the stories of editors, you know, that was my favorite passage in the entire book. I can't believe you want me to take it out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, that's happened to me before too. It it has like I know why I wrote it that way, don't you? Yeah, right. <laughs> Apparently right. not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, I get that question a lot too, and I uh I, sometimes I think people are asking just generally about the idea of what is it like to write a book? Some people are actually asking, what is the actual process that you go through? So I'm grateful mm -hmm. that you shared your idea about the notebook. Uh, I'm a manila folder guy. I'll actually take things from uh, my journal. Yeah. Uh, if I have an idea, I mean, I'm journaling a lot. I'm hearing a speaker and I always put in, if I have an idea while I'm listening to another speaker, I put my idea in brackets so that I know that it's mine and not, not theirs. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. I will eventually get onto a computer and write all those things down in a word document. I will literally print it out and then mm -hmm. slice it up into little slices with every little idea. And then I have my folders for what I think the chapters of the book are going to be. And I just put little things in there. Mm. So that when I'm ready to write the book, I can pull them out, organize them, kind of tape them all together. And that sort of is my, my outline. I don't know anybody else who does it that way, but that's, that's how it works for me. <laughs> oh, that is fascinating. I, I don't know anyone else who does it that way either, but uh, whatever process works for you, really, that's, that's a part of it is figuring out the process that works for you the best. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's helpful to me to think of ideas outside of my head and to to imagine them as just discrete, discrete concepts that do all come together. There's like a puzzle if I can make it all all happen. So, yes. well, thank you for answering that question. I know that may not be one of the typical interview questions that you're getting as you <laughs> are out there talking about the book, but I think that's super helpful. And, and you mentioned having an agent, which I, I think is really important as well. That's somebody out there who can say, I think your platform and the book idea you have has traction or not. They can be honest with mm -hmm. you and yes. help you avoid this sense of, I sent my book idea off to 29 different publishers and, and, and nobody responded kind of thing. Yes. Oh, having an agent is critical in the publishing process. If you actually do want to seek to be published with a traditional publisher. My agent has not been afraid to tell me if something needs work. And I'm grateful for that because I would rather my agent tell me that than a publisher tell me that. Right. Yes. Yeah. Because they don't, they can only do so many books a year. They know that of all the books they do, some of them are going to make money and some of them are going to lose money. Mm -hmm. uh, so every, every new project is a risk and agents tend to understand what different publishers are looking for. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's cool. Well, I really wish you the best with the book. Uh, I know we've got it at Summit Ministries. I was telling you before the show that our students at our Summit Camp in uh, Kentucky all received a copy. It was a gift from the organization that was helping to co-sponsor the event. So, mm, Oh, that, that just absolutely made my day. Such an encouragement to actually hear it getting into the hands of young people like that. And that is so encouraging to me. Well, Sarah, thank you. Thanks for Stand Up, Stand Strong. And thank you for being one who will stand up and stand strong in leading your generation. I just wish you the best. And I just want you to know I'm cheering for you. Mm, thank you so much. I so appreciate that. And I'm so grateful for your work and all that you do in training and equipping us as young people. Um, I love the work of Summit so much. And I'm just so grateful for everything that you do. Uh, it's so needed. And uh, same to you. Keep up the amazing work and thank mm. you. Thank you. 
Thank you to my guest today, Sarah Barrett, for coming on the program. You can find her new book, Stand Up, Stand Strong, at sarahbarrett.com. And you got to spell Barrett correctly, B-A-R-R-A-T-T. So it's S-A-R-A is Sarah, and then Barrett, B-A-R-R-A-T-T.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at Sarah E. Barrett. The Psalm reminds us, how can young people keep their way pure? by guarding it according to your word. Sarah's writing and resources can help do that. Fresh voice, wonderful interview. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to The Dr. Jeff Show. And don't forget, you can help a child attend Summit Summer Session by going to summit.org slash match. All your donations that are tax deductible will be doubled. God bless, have a great week, and we'll see you next time for another Dr. Jeff Show. Listeners, I want you to know that our podcast is on Edify, which is a truly powerful app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. You can download it at edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app. Be sure to share this show if you have enjoyed listening to it and leave a review if you would on the site where you download the show. That helps more people know about the Dr. Jeff show. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.